and I had my faculty perspective. And so I was wondering, Dave, <laughs> looking at this, if part of what we were supposed to, because this is what it made me, like the insight that I was having in looking at what you were asking us, because I was like, well, of course they're all really important, but it, it sort of, it emphasized to me, like, I can say which one is important to me, but what this underscores for me is that I need the perspectives of the other people to, for whom the, the other ones are the priority. Like I need my community partner to be the one who says, no, the community is the most important thing. I need the Bonner Center to say, no, it's, the, it's teaching the civic responsibility. And that it's okay if we kind of take responsibility and ownership for what, I mean, I feel like for me as an academic, it's my job to say what the academic discipline brings to it. And it's okay to let other people do their job and listen to them and have them contribute. So it just, it, it, I was wondering if that was the point was like, it made me think like, wow, this just makes me realize like, we all have to be in dialogue and partnership with each other or this can't work. Great, yeah. that's great insight, yeah. So um, that's super, I, I celebrate that. I mean, there, there is a sense of, um, yeah, this is a complicated sort of things to figure out here. And, um, you know, um, just real quick, an example, we had a faculty member who wanted to uh, have a project built into one, a first year seminar uh, and wanted her students to get out and do a, a, a project building uh, something. So I said, great, we have a, a neighbor close to campus who needs a ramp built and this would be as close to campus as students could walk. The, the, it's a critical need because the family, this person has MS and they're carrying, uh, they were carrying him to the car every day to get to work. So it was a needed to happen. And, um, and she said, uh, that's great, but I don't need this till this till this uh, final month of the semester. I don't need this project right now, right? So it, it, the situation was okay. There's a critical need that needs to happen, but also what you know, she had a legitimate syllabus and learning objectives and the course development, and so it really um, was not. I mean, it wasn't going to be fair to, the, to this person needed a ramp built to wait to the end of the semester to, because of the learning objectives of the course. But on the other hand, the faculty member had a legitimate claim that this is not gonna fit in with the learning developmentally in this class. So um, the answer was, okay, both and, right? We will figure out a way to get this ramp built for this person. Um, you know, and so it, it relates to what Sarah was saying in some ways because there's more, there's more to this than this particular class and this particular semester and this particular component. Right, it's part of a, a whole the whole milieu or or broader work that um, we're doing in terms of our partnerships in the community, I, and that, and so I think there's a, we need to respect faculty's legitimate claim for learning objectives in that. So, um, but anyway, I'm sharing more than my my cards, but I, I want to respond to Sarah's question. So let's um, just take a, a couple minutes here and have each of the groups share a piece. Of, uh, of insight related to their discussion. So again, 30 seconds to a minute each, if someone would be willing to just share out, I think there were six groups and that was, is that all right? That'll count for ours, Sarah, is that all right for our group? Okay, is there group, group one? Could we hear from group one? And within Zoom, when you do breakouts, it's probably hard to remember. You don't really, people just get assigned into groups. So just if your group hasn't spoken, Someone should just say, we were in a group, because you probably won't remember the numbers. Sounds good. So I, this is Gilo from Spelman in Atlanta. I think I was in group one. Um, we talked about the importance of students being engaged with community during the time that they are matriculating through college and not just being isolated in a campus environment. Um, so we felt that that was important. And we felt that that was actually captured by a couple of different points on the survey. We thought that it spoke to teaching um, civic responsibility, but also to the relevancy of the discipline, the public relevancy, and then of course, engaging students in the community. Great, that's great, thank you. Um, can we hear another group response? Thank you. Hello. 
I was in a uh, group five. Um, and I chose that it was important to the last one about having students engage in their local communities. Um, purely because where I go to school, it's very much a bubble. Uh, kids kind of have their own beliefs and don't realize what's happening in the outside world. Um, so we all took a trip about 30 minutes north to Apopka, Florida. And I was just telling my group about my experience living with undocumented immigrants and being housed with them and living with them for about three days and how it really opened up my eyes and my peers' eyes to the issues going on just 30 minutes away from where we go to school and how we need to be more proactive and fight and advocate for them because they don't necessarily have a voice 100% of the time. Um, so I was more thinking that when we engage students in our local community, it allows them to be a more well-rounded person and open up their mind and kind of pop that bubble. Great, Joshua. Thanks for sharing that. Was that in a course, related to a course, or was it part of a co-curricular effort, just so we all understand? It, the piece of it? It, was a, uh, it was a class, all Bonners, all the freshman Bonner. I'm a rising sophomore. So all the freshman Bonners at Rollins engage in it over winter break as a class. So we would read books and discuss journal entries about what we went through for that week. Great, super, great example. Thanks for chiming in. I think we have time for one more group to report out. So um, whoever gets in there and gives us a, and then we'll go on. I'll go, this is Arlette from Wagner College. In our group, we actually spoke about the one that no one voted for, which is faculty research. We actually claim that it's one of the um, preconditions for faculty to be engaged in this work. I, there always have to be some kind of self-interest, especially for faculty, to align. Like if you think about it, I mean, what moves you? What's your what you're passionate about? Therefore, everything else follows, right? Uh, the learning outcomes follows. Uh, your need for engaging community in the things that you're interested in, so that they can see it, so that you can write about it. So. Uh, we also mentioned that we just didn't want to admit that we are a little bit selfish, and that's why there were no one, no one selected that. All right. They, All right. Well, I would give you a hug if I could. So thank you for bringing that up. It's important. Um, and you. part of the most important thing about a, a faculty member doing this the first time is that they do it a second time and a third time, a fourth time. That the weariness of community partners when this is kind of a one time in and out. So is not is not what we're going for. We're talking about sustained commitment and building trust over a long haul. And so the fact that faculty see this a part of who they are um, it is, is a strong incentive for the, the possibility of this continuing um, semester after semester. So I, I appreciate the fact that you were bold enough to discuss that. So great. So Lauren, at this point, um, I'm going to, so thank you all for that. It, you know, I'm sorry we didn't come away with great resolution around that, but it's something worth at least thinking about. So Lauren, um, over to you. Okay. I am pulling up our slides for today. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it because I can't see what's happening right now. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through um, some of the slide. I don't think we're gonna have time to cover everything. Um, at this point because of the great discussions. Um, but I wanted to get us started with um, a quote that I had from a student in one of my classes. Um, we were talking about conducting scholarship as faculty and I do encourage any um, faculty or staff or anybody who's doing this type of work to think about how you can tie this into um, your scholarship. Uh, at Allegheny, luckily, um, this is recognized as, as our scholarship and as important pedagogy. Um, but I wanted to share this quote with you. This is from a student um, who was writing a final paper. Um, Throughout this semester, there has been one recurring thought that I cannot shake. I need more community-engaged learning. I need more engaging experiences outside of my comfort zone, communities that make me feel uncomfortable, and community that makes me check my power and privilege. This experience has exposed me to how much I do not know and how much I want to learn. I think the quote um, 
speaks for itself. It's, it's really, really great. Um, it's why we do this stuff. Uh, so I thought this was a good way to kind of kick us off. Um, so just briefly, our goal here was to give you um, a starting point to think about um, community gauge learning in a classroom. Um, this is a, a very brief presentation, um, the basic fundamentals to maybe get uh, folks excited about developing your own craft of community engaged learning and teaching. Um, we know that this isn't a plug and play type of approach and requires specific uh, sets of skills and tools compared to traditional classrooms. Um, so we need to be um, thinking about the ethical uh, considerations and doing this work with competence. So we're gonna do a very brief overview of some definitions, theory, framework of best practices. There's a lot of research out there and how to do this right. Um, well, if we have enough time, I'm going to talk a little bit about my lessons learned. Um, I have many of them uh, from doing this type of work and then hopefully some time for discussion um, and questions and answers. Um, just very briefly, um, this is, this is a, a good place for us to think about um, and is tied into our reasons for doing this type of work and is thinking about your, post, your personal motivations, thinking about your why. Um, why are you even considering doing this work? Why are you interested in this work? Um, of course, it's recommended to engage in reflective practice whenever you're thinking about this work. Um, so I just have a few reflection questions for you to be thinking about. Um, you know, as we move throughout this presentation today, and just as a reminder, uh, just to highlight what Dave said, is that many people come to the table uh, to do community engagement work for many different reasons, um, and that's okay, and your reasons might change. Um, so for me, as a faculty member, my initial motivation was from a pedagogical standpoint. Um, I thought that this was just a, a great way to help my students learn and enhance my student learning objectives. And my motivations have changed as I've um, continued to do this work to a more um, personal commitment to addressing um, social justice issues. So I encourage you to think about um, and reflect on these questions on the slide. The article that she has put there is an article that uh, outlines um, seven pathways for faculty to get involved. So again, the reference will be there, but um, uh, just to mention that that it's a very it's a very rich piece uh, to consider, and as you consider your own your own motivation for this, but also those who will be enabling empowering others uh, to do that, that the faculty will come at this from very different places, and that's perfectly all right. Right. Thank you, Dave. Um, just to start off with a definition, um, there's many def definitions of community engaged learning. Um, and this is just one uh, or, or a couple points, um, but the key points here is that it's explicitly tied to learning both in and with community groups and organizations and is based off principles of partnership, mutuality, and reciprocity. Um, I just want to highlight that, as we all know, that this type of work is um, very relational sh relationship driven. Um, and community engaged learning is uh, a pedagogical tool, a high impact practice um, that has demonstrated to help with student success and retention and learning. And our focus today will be on uh, community engagement service learning, but as you can see, there are other uh, strategies or instructional pedagogical strategies that um, can foster this type of learning. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. Right. So just uh, as this as this movement has evolved, there's been um, some really great critical work done around what does it mean to get our students out in the community? And in the beginning, obviously, very much interested in what students are learning and, um, you know, the, the argument that this is a worthwhile pedagogy. Um, and yet there was a sense that this wasn't really mature. And so the work of John Saltmarsh, who is um, you know, kind of the architect of the Carnegie Community Engaged Classification uh, and others have done work about, okay, let's take this to the next level. So um, this is a framework that is coming out of a de the Democratic White, Democratic Engagement White Paper uh, that came out in 2009, about a decade ago. And it's, you know, again, uh, an article that speaks to us moving from just civic engagement to democratic civic engagement. And what does it mean when we really take seriously reciprocity, community as assets, and also uh, 
collaborative problem solving. So again, just a reference there, um, uh, the Democratic White Paper, and we'll have these references at the end. Okay. This next one is um, an initiative that came out of the Bonner Foundation among some of the schools, not all of them were able to participate in that. Um, and so that AACNU, the American Association of College and University, has developed uh, with great research, high impact practices. In other words, what are the pedagogies that really are impactful for increasing student learning? And it's tremendous research and it's very important. The Bonner uh, community came alongside that and said, wait, but there's also high impact community engagement practices that go alongside the high impact practices of AACNU. And here's a list of those. This, this initiative started in 2012, and uh, it was an opportunity for teams from different schools to come together and look at how the high impact practices of AACNU interface with high impact community engagement practices and out of that initiatives were born. So um, uh, just again, that work can be done. The expertise lies within the Bonner community, but to think through as you're doing this work, where does uh, place uh, anchor institutions and place-based work, where is their, their deep work, where is this developmental, um, where is their mentorship, uh, where is their humility um, in this work? So again, just a, another resource that the uh, Bonner Foundation has to offer. Is this me too, Lauren? Yes. Okay, so um, again, we, we've had a lot of learning around this idea again of the difference between um, exploitative partnerships, uh, transactional partnerships, and transformational partnerships. And the, the sense of um, oftentimes we think about venturing out in the community and we really don't think about is this partnership that we're developing really exploitative of the community that we seek to be in partnership with? Or is it transactional? In other words, it's a one time, we're gonna make this, I, I'm gonna meet this expectation, the community's gonna meet this expectation, a one and done uh, situation. Or is it something that's building towards a more transformative or generative uh, partnership? Again, it's an important framework for us to think about from the get go as we move into this work. Okay, um, I'm going to just talk a little bit of nuts and bolts um, and briefly review a uh, framework uh, that can be used to incorporate this type of work and the best practices of community engagement and service learning into a, a course. Um, this is a first letter mnemonic uh, opera developed by Welch, um, which again gives us kind of like a little framework and structure. And before thinking even of implementing this type of work into a classwork, classroom, it's important to, to think about your instructional objectives, your student learning objectives. What do you want students to be able to do at the end of the semester? Um, and I think that the key is to think about how this pedagogy, how community engaged learning will assist you in meeting those goals. And thinking critically about this in order to make an informed decision of whether this is a ped an appropriate pedagogical tool. There's other ways that you can get students to apply work and reflect, um, and this is just one. Um, I'm gonna just briefly, before I move into talking about the, the P uh, or partnerships, is to just share some examples of um, engagement, um, ways that you can implement this into a course. Engagement can be structured very differently, can look a hundred different ways based off of the course, based off of the, the student learning objectives, the partner's goals. Um, so it really depends on the uh, student learning objectives and the community needs. Um, and really needs to be considered in the developmental framework of the student as well. Um, so is the community engaged learning developmentally appropriate for the stage and preparation for students? Um, so for example, what I have my students doing in a first year seminar um, is gonna be very different than what I do have my students do in my upper level clinical psychology class. But the idea is that there isn't this one size fits all mentality um, engagements likely to be structured in many different ways that are listed here or even a combination of ways. Um, so just briefly, for example, this first bullet point semester long weekly required service engagement. This is what I do in my class. Um, so my students um, 
engage in community work for two hours a week throughout the semester. Um, but it could look very different depending on your, your needs and the um, provider's needs. Um, also for your reference, I wanted to give you some examples of what this work would look like in specific disciplines. Um, just to open you up to ideas. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read through these, but you can see um, that these projects or these um, different uh, engagements have patterns, right? So it's encouraging greater understanding of social issues, encouraging civic responsibility of students, um, and really just a general sense of caring. And then um, I just wanted to provide you with some examples of um, community engagement service learning objectives. So researchers have conduct, conducted analyses of community engaged learning courses. And these were the three most common learning outcomes um, that uh, individuals had in, in their course objectives. So you can read through, through this and again, think about how this pedagogy can assist you in meeting your learning objectives for the class. Okay, so um, just moving on uh, to the rest of Welsh's mnemonics. Um, the next step after you determine your uh, student learning objectives is to um, develop and explore community partnerships. Um, you might have uh, offices that can help link you up to partners who are looking um, to uh, engage in this type of work. Um, but again, this is really important to focus on the importance of the partnerships and sharing those resources and making sure that the um, relationships are based off of respect and genuineness and um, mutual trust. And then we move on to engagement. So this refers to the who, the what, the where of engagement. Um, what will students be doing at the sites? Uh, what will these projects look like? And then we can move on to um, developing the course syllabus and the assignments. And a key point to this, um, el an element to how this work is differentiated and defined from other uh, methods of teaching and learning is reflection. And Kolb's model, which is, um, you can see the diagram on the right, which shows the experiential learning cycle. Um, this is a, a great example of how you can help students make those connections between what's happening in the community um, with the work and the course content. Um, and this reflection can have a uh, range from weekly reflections to structured reflections, group um, discussions, guided discussions. Um, but it's, it's really important to articulate to students that the engagement is part of the learning process just like readings, assignments, um, written papers, exams, um, the community engagement service learning is considered part of the text. And then finally, you add the assessment. So how are you gonna evaluate grade uh, the service learning? Um, so you can see here that this is really um, an example of backwards um, course design where you're starting with, what do I want my student learning objectives to be? You work throughout the whole cycle and then you think about assessment. Um, and evaluating students' work. Okay, um, so I'm gonna share um, some of my many lessons learned uh, briefly. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Okay, um, my, I wanna give you uh, some practical suggestions or suggestions that you can take to faculty who are interested in doing this work. Um, but I also wanna highlight that it's okay that if it doesn't um, go perfectly the first time, you can try again. Um, I certainly learned from many of my um, mistakes and uh, really consider this an iterative process where you, uh, you learn and make changes as you, as you go throughout. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly cover a couple of these lessons learned. Um, so preparation and managing expectations. Um, one of the things that I have been able to do at Allegheny is we are able to designate courses as signature courses. Um, so in order for a student to take my course, they have to come see me face to face. Um, and then I start letting them know about the expectations of the community engagement service learning. So they're advised well beforehand. Um, so I think that's a really important piece. And then um, I prepare my students in the first two weeks of um, the semester. Um, I consider this an orientation um, 
uh, time where we have scaffolded readings, where we talk about what community engagement and service learning is and isn't. Um, we talk about some of the issues that uh, the community partners and their consumers um, are dealing with. So this, this requires some scaffold, scaffolded reading and lots of meditation, med, meta teaching. But um, I also have an orientation where the community partners come into my classroom and they talk about their programs, they talk about the projects, they talk about expectations, um, and we actually work together to develop a contract um, that everybody signs so everybody knows the expectations. Um, and uh, that's just another good way to manage expectations. I also um, complete mid-semester check-ins individually. So I have individual conferences with all my students. So that way I can check in and see how things are going and address any concerns. And then um, tied into this is uh, the students as colleagues. I also um, have uh, some members of um, ACES, which is Allegheny Civic Engagement Student Fellows. Um, so these are students who are trained in this type of work and they come into the class and they teach the students um, how to do this work. They talk about um, stereotypes of uh, community members and then maybe even uh, the stereotypes that community members have of our Allegheny students. Um, and we also talk about town gown relationships and um, I think that's a really effective way of managing expectations as well. Um, being a good partner, uh, Open communication, I think, is really important. This is something that my partners have talked about, um, that they really like what I do. And it can be just an email that you know, I send out um, within the first week of, of the course. I send it mid-semester and at the end of the semester where I just check in. Um, I assume no news is good news and I keep my door open um, for any concerns that might bubble up um, that need to be addressed. Um, I'll talk about flipping the classroom and letting go of control together. Um, I think that for me, I had to rethink my role um, as a professor um, and, and understanding this is a very different type of pedagogy than what I would do in maybe other classes where my role kind of shifted away from this transmission of knowledge to a more um, mixed pedagogical approach where I'm facilitating and I'm guiding. Um, and there's a lot of great things that are happening outside of the classroom um, and we process it within the classroom. Uh, you know, letting go of control uh, that my partners have incredible amounts of experience and knowledge and expertise that they can um, present to my students as well. Um, Making connections, I'll just say briefly, uh, this is something that I learned over the semesters is that sometimes students struggled with making connections between what was happening um, in their uh, experiences in the community and our course objectives. And I knew they were happening. Um, so this required a lot of meta teaching. But one of the best things I did was I brought in even more class discussions where the students learned from each other. So they shared their experiences. Um, some of them were working at different sites, so they were able to learn from each other. Um, even students who were working in the same sites um, were able to help the other students make connections. So that was just a really um, powerful pedagogical tool as well. Um, I talked about using students as colleagues. Um, if you don't have an ACES program like we have at Allegheny, even if you have a really great TA that could help you um, run reflections, um, working through logistics like scheduling, transportation, if do students have cars, those kinds of um, concerns that do bubble up that need to be addressed and thought, thought through earlier on. Um, Let's see, I'm going to just go ahead and bump down to risks and challenges um, just for time purposes. Um, I will say, um, to be honest, that uh, this was a lot of work um, at the beginning. There was a lot of energy up front um, that I needed to be thinking about, um, but I can't imagine teaching my course any other way at this point. Um, and um, the benefits have certainly outweighed um, the, the risks or challenges. Um, 
I have some student reflections here. I'm not going to read them um, to you, but I think that this just kind of highlights for me when I saw these quotes from my students, I was like, yes, this is so worth it, right? Community engagement, best experience of academic career. All right, that's all I needed, right? For all the work that I put into it. Um, so there's a lot of energy up front and um, there are risks. Um, when I first implemented this um, into my clinical psychology class, I had really awesome um, student uh, evaluations in this class. And the first semester that I implemented the community engagement, they dipped down a little bit. And that was on me um, because I didn't think about balancing um, the student's work. Um, I ended up having to remove an entire text um, the next time I taught the class because it was just too much um, and I didn't think through that. Um, so I had that risk, right? My, my, um, my scores dipped down a little bit and then I made changes as I learned and um, they've, they've gone back up. Um, but that's something that is shown in the literature and is, is, is um, something to consider as well. Okay, Dave, I think it's over to you now. Thank you, Lauren, that's great. So we thought we would um, pause here for a minute to make sure if someone had a comment to everyone real quick or a question back to Lauren, and then we have time to move again into a seven minute breakout room and time to bring back. So that was amazing how you were able to do that as concisely as you did, Lauren, I appreciate it. But does anyone have, before we break up into groups, does anyone have a comment, a thought, or an insight? Um, you know, again, uh, the student experience we'd invite in here, and certainly those of you who have also worked in roles of um, mentoring or uh, training uh, and supporting faculty in this work, feel free to chime in. We'll take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, hi, this is Anne from Mars Hill. Um, I think it would be interesting in, in thinking about the slides that were presented on understanding the pathway that students take to engagement learning, that a similar pathway be drawn up for working with faculty. Um, and, you know, what was brought up in our small group is context was so important and understanding the community partners needs and understanding the faculty partners desires and needs and that kind of thing and bridging those two um, is really, at, well, at least at our institution was solely done in part because of our Bonner program and we built into that the academic mission um, and bridging it that way um, to expand the touch basically of our faculty. That's great, that's good. Ari, do you wanna say anything about that or Lauren? Yeah, I can actually, um, just as a resource, because I know Lauren, you used Marshall Welch's opera. So, uh, but Marshall Welch and Star Moore Plaxton, uh, they have a book that came out and that book actually, Anne, has a developmental model for faculty work. That's it, the craft that's of the, the and the has the learning. Book. And in, a, in, a, in the Bonner Learning Community that uh, someone also asked, Sierra asked, could, is the PowerPoint that you all did available? And I just put the link to where it's posted. But that same platform, please join that because this, like, this webinar will be put there as a video. The handouts are there. And there's a taped video already with Marshall and Star talking about that book. Um, and then, Ann, you also asked about how to handle privilege issues and just discussion I'm gonna and I was gonna post something that's actually on the wiki um, it's it's I would recommend the work of Tania Mitchell um, who actually has articles on like exploring service learning as a pedagogy of whiteness um, how faculty can avoid uh, doing this work in a way that reinforces stereotypes and oppression etc so I'll, I'll post the I'll post the link to something. It's actually on our wiki. There's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of scholarship as well as like train faculty development trainings you can use. 
And then and my only other comment there, and to that, uh, is to understand part of the way to understand faculty pathways into this is to uh, do some work around what are the disincentives in your particular institution around this work. And to begin to identify those by listening to your colleagues around you know, uh, their conversations or their challenges. Um, Lauren mentioned one, right? Uh, student evaluation, uh, the fear of that could be a, a important dis uh, disincentive for this work. And then the other piece is to say that there's not just one pathway, there's multiple pathways and, and to give faculty permission to just do their own work and understanding why this is where they wanna go and why they wanna move into this work and then creating the support structures to help them move through the pathways that work for them. So I appreciate well, the question. Yeah, while I appreciate that, I think the thing that my faculty would push back on is that they ain't got time for this on top of everything else and the stuff that's going on. And so I think one of the things that I have found is my role as faculty fellow is to digest the volume of things that are out there down into a slide that I can give them and they can just roll with. And taking, they don't have time to do the research on their own. <laughs> And so, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can add to that too. I think that's great um, that you can kind of narrow that down for folks, but um, even thinking about how you can use students as, how faculty can use students as colleagues, um, you know, to helping with the logistics, helping with some of those, um, the busier work that, um, that faculty really don't have to do. So that would be another suggestion as well, if you haven't thought about it. Great, and we certainly, I'm happy to continue this conversation at some point down the road as well. So, so we have 15 minutes left, 14 minutes left. We're gonna spend some, seven minutes in the breakout um, around uh, questions about, um, and then bring it back together and have a, again, some time to talk as a whole. So, so what are your key learnings at this point? Uh, what further questions do you have? Um, and let's take that into the groups again, just um, try and make sure you hear from all the voices in your room. We'd appreciate that. Uh, again, what are you learning? What are the key takeaways for you? And then what, what still is unresolved? What still questions would you like um, addressed? And we'll, we'll pay attention to all of that. So Ari, would you be so kind as to launch us again? Now we're, we're at 22, so I think we could go with um, five groups would be fine. Great. I think those other folks may just have stepped away from their computers or something. That might mean that they're not going into the, them. Oh, they're, they're there. That's fine. Um, so that, Lauren, great. That was great. Yeah, um, that was good. Yeah. Well, it was fast because I, I knew we were way behind. <laughs> so I was like, how to get through this? <laughs> uh, the discussion earlier was very rich and a lot of the folks that you're speaking with, I think right now, at least the ones that have their screens on, I think a lot of the ones that don't are our students, honestly, are the ones that are, you know, but the other ones, a lot of them are kind of like you, you like um, experienced practitioners. So I, I saw like that, like Jess, she's also a faculty fellow from Stockton. She made that comment like that just um, that this, this, this reflects like this body of practice. So I think it's been really good. Yeah. I think this group would love to have even a deeper, like someone said they want to talk more about that issue of research and tenure and stuff. So. I mean, in some ways, Ari, this I'm not going to join a group this time because I think that's how that mess up happened. Yeah, well, I think, and I got in the group. Uh, and it's like I, and the, the meeting instead of the group. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as I got into the meeting, then they didn't, they wanted to just talk to, they didn't want to do their own work. So oh, I'm, I'm not going to go in. So that's fine. But, um, 
Yeah, and I think Ari, I'm really glad you're here. And, and um, you know, I think that, you know, this might be a good jumping off point for other work that we have to do down move the, moving forward, you know. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah, what I'm trying to get at though is there's a lot of interesting stages in it. Like there's just like like the forum that you know, like you did at Allegheny, like you were at least the parts I joined, like even the small groups, there were a lot of faculty that were new to this work, right? And they were like they this they were being like their eyes were open, oh my gosh, I could do this, and they were getting mm -hmm. on that pathway. And then we've got also these other folks that are like they've been on that like Anne, the one that's asking the questions and stuff and they're they're real they they want to they're they're wrestling with how to move the whole institution forward yep. and i yep. think that's what that would be a cool thing to get our community engaged learning teams talking about that's probably what you're referring to too Dave, right like what's the next stage of like strategy work um yeah as <laughs> what like in terms of institutional strategy especially now considering the impact of COVID and recession and like Black Lives Matter, you know, like all that's happening, like how is us all gonna <laughs> affect? Yeah, I mean, it's related and, and, and yet it's really a different, it's a different level of conversation, you know, I mean, it's the provost conversations, you know, it's the president's conversations and also these great advocates in the trenches, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how can they not have these? I mean, how can it, you know? Um, so I, I think there's a lot, a lot um, to be said for, you know, kind of what is this going to, what's this going to ask of us, you know, from here? Um, what are you going to go to in the next block? Are you going to go to the next block? I was going to go to the one by uh, Southern, uh, um, what the heck was it? Uh, yes, I was going to go. Um, I missed the one I was going to go to yesterday because we were chatting and then I, I missed, I thought it started at noon. I thought it started at one, um, uh, but I didn't even write it down. Um, yeah, I was going to go to the one, is it Southern, Southern? Mm. I don't know. I'll have to look and see. Uh, I, well, one I, I, I wish I could go to, but I can't. I didn't know if one of you were going to go to is the one that Marina Barnett from Widener is doing. The one that's called Teaching Tools for Keeping the Community in Virtual Community Engaged Learning. Um, I have to go to the one that Om Prakash is doing because otherwise I've been trying to go to these CEL sessions. But Marina's kind of like you, Lauren, like she's a really very experienced. She's, she's been the one running the, the Service Learning Fellows Program um, for like 20 years at Widener. And so like she, she's African-American woman. She's been doing all this stuff right now with like teaching other faculty how to do this work remotely in light of this, this, these changes. Cause people are foreseeing, all the staff in our campuses are foreseeing this is gonna la like this is not gonna change in the fall. Even yeah. if people come back because the liability issues are so much that the institutions will say, sorry, you can't do that. You know, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm already not planning on doing any engagement work. And I, I had originally planned in all three of my classes this fall. And I'm, I'm going to have to just make another alternative <laughs> assignment because I'm just not going to be able to do it. I've reached out to all my partners and they're just trying to figure out what they're and doing. That's where everyone is at. And mm -hmm. Should we um, close the room, Dave, just to give that's people not, I think sounds, that was about seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. I make sure not to push the wrong button. Here. Yeah, I, I, I want to make sure I'm in the right spot. So. <laughs> People should be coming back. It's, they have 51 seconds. Okay. Hey. Okay. And then the, the and then there were seventeen. Is that right? <laughs> so I appreciate people if they need to step out to take care of themselves and take a break. So, um, great. Um, 
Sure. Okay. So let's just open this up for um, uh, issues and thoughts that came out of this last breakout session. And again, the resources, this PowerPoint will be available to others. So feel free to direct the questions to the whole group or to Lauren, to Ari or myself, um, and we'll do our best. So um, what did you talk about? What, did you, what are you hearing? We didn't talk about this, but it was something that I wanted to talk about. This is Karen Barron. I'm from Washburn University, and I am in the English department faculty and also the coordinator for community-engaged learning um, through our, our center, which is uh, the Center for Teaching Excellence and Learning. So, but, and so what I have been um, thinking about, wondering about, and wanted your uh, thoughts on, everybody's thoughts on, um, is that, you know, this relationship, this partnership between faculty and community partners is supposed to be, um, you know, reciprocal. And so if the faculty member is developing, you know, looking at learning objectives and developing, um, you know, a project or uh, somehow integrating um, community engaged learning into their course, then when they get a partner, um, to me, it shouldn't be too, uh, I don't know, I, I, I just feel like the, the faculty member shouldn't be too married to, to their ideas, but maybe, you know, have an idea and then work out uh, what exactly is going to happen, what the needs are of the community partner, and then they both craft it together, they build it together. And I'm wondering, you know, what you think about that. Great question. So let's open this up to the whole group in terms of a response to that. Uh, Karen, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I re, I re, we met at uh, Waynesburg, I think, last summer. So yes. Yeah, yes. great. So thank you. Nice you to know. see you. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Um, how does that? How does that work when you're creating, you, you know, the fact of coming in with an idea and meeting with a community partner and how does it actually um, you know, I, I appreciated Lauren's insight that, she, you know, there's an element of giving up control, but other thoughts, other folks may, ha may have insights on that. So, uh, we actually did this as a workshop in a stage model with our faculty at Mars Hill. And so we brought the faculty 